Yes, thanks, Michael. Sorry. Um, so yes, Foya is your friend. Um, and I want you to pay attention to this cute little guy here on the screen. Um, guess who he is, but there's a little bit of a, a little more to that um, fun little tidbit. Um, so, ooh, didn't want that. So um, what have you heard about FOIA? I'm, I'm very curious to know. So uh, if you want to put your answers in the chat, I um, want to know who, how many of you have actually filed FOIA requests um, and how many of you have dealt with rejections or dismissals. It'd be really good to know um, and see. I wonder if I can see the chat here. Um, federal government, yeah. Uh, or state requests, which is a whole nother section of that. Um, your Boston City, okay, cool. Um, and how many of you haven't filed FOIA requests? And that's okay if you haven't, this is part of what we're doing. Um, okay, so some FOIA is here. Wonderful, so I think most of you have an understanding, hundreds of FOIAs, it's a lot, yeah. Um, but I think most of us here want to either get brushed up or um, understand what FOIA is. So we're going to walk through that. And again, questions, uh, feel free to submit them in the chat. Um, so here at Muckrock, we have had roughly 9 million pages of documents through requests. We've had 126,000 requests filed through our um, website and through our application. Uh, we've connected with 23,000 agencies and had uh, submissions to request to all 50 states or um, and federal agencies. So we do a lot here at Muckrock, um, and we want to make sure that what we do suits journalists. Uh, our mission is to provide tools, news, and support to help journalists do their jobs more effectively. And that's basically what we do. Um, we've learned tricks and techniques that help get newsrooms the most uh, out of their requests. And uh, that's <laughs> basically what it is. Um, and Michael is our one of our founders. Uh, so he's been at it for a long time as well and very knowledgeable. Um, we host a few different other options out of Muckrock, including Document Cloud, which is a PDF hosting site um, used by journalists all over the world. Uh, all of our documents are uploaded to Muckrock, uh, are hosted on Document Cloud. Um, we also have a FOIA machine. Uh, it's a site similar to Muckrock, um, and it allows you to upload and track your own requests. Uh, o Transcribe assists in tran the transcription process and basically auto reruns audio. Um, we have, let's see, FOIA, oh, and a new tool, FOIA Log Explorer, um, which basically is going to pull documents and create a FOIA log to see what has been requested and what is available. Um, and here's the front page of our site. Um, basically, we give you news, provide resources to agencies um, uh, about agencies and jurisdictions and individual requests. Uh, we have different projects that we uh, post, and you can see a live um, show of what our documents are going through. So that's a really quick and brief example of what Mockrock is and does. And we can go more to that if you have any other questions at the end, and I'm happy to share. Um, so there is a really general expectation that FOIA processes are frustrating, and that's that's true sometimes, right? Um, but some of the struggles that people have with FOIA can be easily avoided, and we're going to walk through them today on how to overcome them and what you can do to make your FOIA process really work for you and your agency or your newsroom. Um, but first, we really have to start with the basics. What is FOIA, right? And we're going to walk through the expectations and steps to get that get that request submitted and move forward. Um, and again, we'll come back to your questions about that. So what is the Freedom of Information Act? Um, and what is a Freedom of Information request? Uh, does anybody have an idea about that really quickly in the chat? What is FOIA or FOI? Well, the Freedom of Information Act is a law and it's super cool and super fun. And it, <laughs> after Watergate, 
Yeah, we're going to go into that in, in a second, but um, it's changed, right? And it's evolved with the needs of the public um, and sometimes against the needs of the public. And it, it, it's a little complicated, but very straightforward. Um, so the Freedom of Information Act um, is interchangeable, right? We see it a lot of different ways. Um, some people use FOIA as a verb. Um, some people use it just overarchingly, and that can get com uh, confusing. But it's a federal allow a law that allows access to government records or a catch-all term um, in fifty-three states, or excuse me, fifty states and jurisdictions. Yeah, it's a public law outlining what must be available to the public, um, and it, um, sorry. <laughs> allows the public access to records, typically unless those records are specifically exempt. And there are some exemptions that occur in FOIA. Um, it just doesn't, doesn't generally allow you to make uh, open-ended questions um, or even get uh, clarification on records. It just allows you access to those records. Um, so FOIA started in July, on July 4th of 1996, uh, excuse me, 1966. Uh, and it was signed by uh, President Johnson at the time. And you can see the, him there with his dog and I presume his grandchild. Um, but in 1974, after Watergate, uh, FOIA amendments were made and they added the Privacy Act, which gave some FOIA some more teeth. Um, and there are some exemptions, uh, nine of them, including uh, a catch-all exemption, which is BC, uh, B3, that allows other laws to exempt material from documents that they re release. Um, and then there are state public records laws. And each state has its own public record law, including um, some jurisdictions outside of uh, DC um, that are very different. And they have different exemptions. So what might be allowed to be requested in California might not be requestable in uh, South Dakota, for example. Um, and there are different appeal process, different requirements. Um, they're usually faster, but they're not consistent across the board the way that uh, FOIA is. FOIA is across the federal and it's generally consistent among, among agencies. So before you, before you submit your request, you want to research what to request and how to request that, right? You want to know what you're looking for. Instead of asking your question to the agency, ask it about the record. Um, and that that really will get you started with your first requests. And to do that, you have to think like a middle manager. So most requesters come into the process with questions, particularly if you're a reporter, what is going on here? How much is the government spending on whatever topic you're looking at? How dangerous are our schools? But you need to really take off that mentality of being a reporter and try really hard to think like a bureaucrat in the rule of the government, um, particularly someone who is managing the records, usually going through a lot of paperwork around the subject you're interested in. So putting yourself in that mindset will help you develop your request, submit it, and hopefully get you more um, access to the records you're looking for. So. Some resources to do that before you launch into writing the request are looking at the government's or the agency's website, seeing what's available, um, what record, what the records retention schedule is, which basically means how long they're required to take any given record, um, how long they're allowed to keep any given record, uh, what their system's like. Um, look through Muckrock and see what's already been requested um, and what agency page, pages say. Look at Document Cloud. Um, you can even Google stuff and see what's um, out there. There's some cool uh, tips and tricks. Um, and there's also news articles and press releases. There's a really great book um, called The Art of Access by David Collier uh, and Charles Davis that will help you get those documents. So as you would approach any story, you want to approach FOIA with some backgrounding. And there's a lot of great ways to do that. Um, so looking at, of course, at the agency's website uh, is a great start, as I mentioned. Um, the retention schedules, there's a list of resources to run through. Um, it's fantastic to know so that, for example, if you're requesting police records, 
you know that 911 calls are only kept for X amount of time based on the agency or emails from former employers in the federal government, you know, get deleted after a certain time. So that's really important to, to do. Um, and then, of course, using Muckrock uh, to generate ideas and uh, pull from Document Cloud. You can search Muckrock and see what's been uh, uh, already requested. You can look by agency. You can look by subject. And usually public uh, public requests will show you the documents that have been delivered. They'll show you what the request conversation has been like, the agency's response, if there's any exemptions, what's been done, what appeals have been made. So it's a really great tool to see what um, you can you can use from there, right? And better format your request to the agency so that you don't get those same denials or you get better records or more detailed records. Um, here you go, Let's, I'll look at the Department of uh, Homeland uh, Security and you can see some of the different requests, the statuses. Um, and one, one thing that's really great about Muckrock is that it tells you along the process of your request, if there's no responsive records, as you can see there, um, when the agency is waiting to respond to your request, if your request has been filed, uh, when it's been filed. So it's a really great tool and pretty comprehensive in that regard. Um, and I think I just went over this. Um, oh, this is Document Cloud. So Document Cloud here shows you um, all kinds of information. It uploads the PDF and you're allowed to search through that look through it. Um, again, another great resource for what's been released, what's um, been used. Uh, and then there's Google. So Google has some really cool search options. Um, they're called Google dorks, which has always tickled me. But um, you would basically put the topic you're interested in, like housing, for example, the site you want to go to, which is .gov, um, which will expand any website that has the ending of .gov and the file type. So PDF, PowerPoint, um, Excel, whatever you need. Um, you can also use the agency website. So Department of Justice, I think is justice.gov uh, if you wanna specifically search only the Department of Justice, but if you are more searching broadly, .gov is fine. Um, and you can do it with keywords or without. Um, if you search it with keywords or specific phrases, that'll get you better results. Um, otherwise, you know, it's, it's a fishing expedition. Um, and so the resource for infiltrating, again, is the agency's website, retention schedules, document cloud. Um, so I already went over this. Um, so now we want to know what middle managers actually do, right? Um, they have mandatory reporting requirements um, and they generally have to put something in writing when they do their reports. Um, they, You want to think through the paperwork needed to go through a program. So if you're looking, let's take colleges, for example, your college is planning to build a new structure. Well, to build that new structure, there's a lot of documents, conversations, and meetings that have to have that have to happen, right? So the forms that they need to fill out to submit that request to their board of governors or the chancellor, whoever they're um, required to uh, meet with, uh, you would be able to find documents relating to that. Um, they usually have um, information um, with a public forum and they release press releases, right? So that's good information to tell you that there is documents behind that. Um, this cute little image here uh, was actually pulled from the NSA and could help you, you know, could help lead to an interesting story. Um, and I've lost my notes. Sorry, bear with me just a second. Um, and so that little meeting, uh, the cute little recycle thing was from an NSA internal recycling campaign. So, you know, the documents that come from these internal meeting minutes can actually go and lead you to different stories. Um, and they often collaborate with other agencies. Uh, so if your college, for example, is building that parking structure and they're partnering with, you know, 
Sally's construction company. You can usually find that information. They have to have open bids. So you can work through that to find ideas for stories and see the different paperwork that's going on. Um, and again, you know, thinking how bureaucrats and middle managers work, um, everything is filed away, everything is a memo, is a note, is a meeting minute, um, and that's all requestable usually, um, depending on where you're at, what federal agency or what state. Um, so looking through some paperwork uh, that you can get, uh, we we'll see here that there was a thousand DC schools are unlicensed. And so looking through what are the requirements of filing, um, each teacher has, you know, to be licensed through the state, puts through the, through, puts through a request. And, you know, that's this story right here was able to find that information through just a simple records request and found that a thousand teachers weren't licensed, which is kind of scary to think about. Um, and you want to localize your your story, right? Um, how many in how much information is available about your school, about your program, about whatever agency you're looking at, um, and seeing what the the policies are there with you know schools like taking it back to this construction site. Are there zoning requirements in the city that your university or college is at? Um, does the agency have to meet specific um, but, uh, federal requirements or environmental releases, looking through those documents and requesting them can really help you build out a story. Um, and, you know, if you get denied a request, that can also be a story. Why is, why are, why is the agency just, uh, uh, denying you? Um, and have they done it multiple times? Is there, um, information that can, that they're trying to bury, you know? So, using all avenues of your requests in different ways can help you build out your story and then lead to bigger requests or more detailed requests and documents. Um, and then, you know, details that might seem mundane might actually lead to really fun and interesting stories. This example here is about uh, the soda company uh, with your, at your school, you know, who actually runs it and why can't you get a Coke? And why do you have to get Pepsi? Um, I, I don't drink dark sodas. So I don't really have a preference, but I do prefer a Sierra Mist. So when they're Sprite, I get a little disappointed. Um, and back to that uh, fun little green guy, he's actually the EPA's mascot. Um, and they call him the Green Reaper, which is, again, so silly, but that was found through, you know, public records and documents and makes a fun little story that you can share for your audience or your readers. So understanding how different documents, different records, different reports can lead into stories is really great. And if we have an idea of what's out there, then we can actually start writing our requests. So here we are to writing the request now. So requests should be specific. You should know what you want ahead of time and be able to articulate that. Um, the more specific you are and the more evidence that you have that documents exist, the better. If you ask an agency for a form, you know, 993 or whatever it would be called, right? And that form doesn't actually exist, you're going to get a rejection, obviously. But if, if you mistake form 993 for 994, which is more detailed, you know, you can get, you can get it easier, you know, but just know what you want, right? Um, a broad net is sometimes good, but it doesn't, it, it can create complications. Um, and when you're writing your request, make sure that you cite the law, um, you the specific document that you're requesting. Don't ask questions. Um, do you have, you know, a form that tells you about how many students applied for financial aid? You know, you should know that already when you get into it. Um, and then give them detail about locating it, you know, say that it was mentioned in a 2023 report at the beginning of the school year, um, you know, or that it was a form that was filed to the FAFSA, you know, that helps them find the documents that they need, that you need, and we'll give them to you. And then if you have the name of the document, you know, um, let's say it's called 
student financial aid requirements um, or uh, delivery, you know, that, that would help them. So they can just do a search on their internal system. And then, you know, mention who has it. Is it the bursar's office? Is it the financial aid department? Is it, you know, the president's office? Who, you know, so that the records custodian can go straight to that person. Um, and then if there's been any mention of it, you know, in media, you can use that in your request as well. And that'll help them basically find it and kind of not give them an excuse to deny you if they say the record doesn't exist. Um, your records requests should not be uh, overly legalese. Um, you shouldn't cite every single law that might apply to your request. Um, you shouldn't include all kinds of arguments for why this should be released or background on why you're looking at it. They don't really need to know all that. Um, and again, you know, don't use a lot of lingual language. Um, it's important to know that the person, pro there, there's a human processing your request on the other side. And generally they have a lot on their hands. So although it's their job to give us, you know, or process records requests, we want to make sure that we're being as understanding to them and their um, workflow as possible. There's a saying, you get more bees with honey than with vinegar. You know, trying to be as polite and considerate of their time can help you go a long way. Um, so what makes a good request, right? Um, they're clearly defined. They have parameters. So if you know that the document occur or that the document was created on this date, you know, you might set that time frame. Or if you want documents between, you know, from last school year, make sure that you include the start of the school year and the end of the school year, or at least when that would um would uh be created. Um you want to explain your status. Are you a student? Are you from a federal agency? Or where are you working for to give them some um, information about who you are, which could apply to a fee waiver, right? Um, a lot of records cost fees, but you want to make sure that you're getting it for as cheaply as possible, if not free. And if some agencies have uh, fee waivers or exemptions, uh, you want to get you want to get those um, and include them in your initial request. Uh, tell them how you know the the records requests exists, right? Or the documents exist. It wasn't mentioned in a federal filing. Was it mentioned in a press release? You know, um, and be creative about how you get that. Um, and that could be, you know, mentioning that the president said it during their, I don't know, um, homecoming rally. Uh, you know, we're doing this new parking structure and it's going to be finished by the end of the year. You know, we have a partnership with X, you know, so-and-so bring that up uh, included in there um and then you know keep it as simple and minimal as possible one page is plenty um people don't want to read through a million different pages of requests just to find out that you only want one document so being as direct as possible is important um know that it's probably going to get pass passed around um one person might send it to another uh, their supervisor to get clarification, who might send it to an attorney, who might send it back to the original person. So things will get passed around. So just good practice to double check that you're spelling things right, that you're being as concise as possible, and that you, you know, know what you want, essentially. Um, sometimes people within the same agency don't often work together. So understanding that the left hand often has no idea what the right hand is doing is important. The records custodian doesn't always know what the head of the agency is doing or writing. They have to go to that person to ask. Um, so keep that in mind as well. And people like talking on the phone. You know, you might have somebody call, uh, the records custodian might call someone and say, you know, hey, I need to know what's going, going on. But they would also want to talk to you, right? Um, it gets them out of their busy day. So give them a call. And if they need clarification, talk about it. And important to follow up with that with an email so that you keep track of that record request. Um, and then try to think like a FOIA officer. What is their job like and what are they going to need? You know, how long is it going to take and how can you help them make that job, make that time frame easier? So you've submitted your request, right? Um, what now? And for those of you who've seen Barbenheimer, I thought that this would be fun. Um, it, was, it was cute. Um, 
always assume that people are working with you in good faith. It's their job to file or excuse me, submit these requests or produce uh, to get these requests filled. Um, so assume that they're doing it in the best in, in to the best of their abilities. Not everybody is out to deny you. Some people just are, but for the most part, we're going to assume that everybody's doing their job right. Um, let them know when you expect a response. Generally, states, if for um, state requests, there are time limits. Some have 10 days, some have three. It depends on what the state is. Um, and then the federal uh, law also has certain time frames with when agencies are supposed to get back to you. So let them know that you expect a response by that timeline. That, you know, it keeps them honest and keeps you aware of when you can expect something. Um, when they respond to your request, which they're required to do, ask when they'll uh, be able to provide those records. Um, and if they give you an interesting response, make sure that you go through it. It can lie. You know, they might say that it'll take them 15 days to get a single police report. Um, and, you know, you can ask why. Why is it going to take 15 days to get a police report? Or why is it going to take, you know, a month to get the records of the campus cafeteria inspection? You know, that information generally is up online anyway. Why is it going to take so long? So make sure that you're pushing back a little bit on that. Um, and appeal. If you get a denial, appeal and see what you can do. Because sometimes uh, agencies or records custodians will deny something based on one fact. But if you're able to um, explain why it shouldn't have been denied, you can usually get that back. Um, and it can be very simple to do. Excuse me. Um, so they're supposed to give you, they're supposed to have the most generous reading of your request. But if you're planning litigation, um, this is kind of where you can uh, argue a little more. Um, and there, here's a resource that uh, will tell you a little bit more about state guidelines and what the requirements are for um, appealing a request, um, getting your money back from attorney fees and whatnot. And so that's uh, mockrock.com slash place. And then um, rfcp.org slash open government. It's a guide. Um, it's a really great resource to help you out. Um, and then so uh, it can be very simple. Um, Mockrock allows you to do that here. So uh, you can look at exemptions and see what um, is is out there for you. Um, it's it's a tool that we have at Mockrock that will help you appeal your denials or exemptions. Um, key considerations when you're making your appeals: uh, making sure that your exemption that you cite valid exemptions. Is important if you cite an exemption that applies to another agency or another state they're just going to flat out deny you and it makes your life a lot more difficult we're in the business of making things as easy as possible for foia requests and document requests so um making sure that everything is valid is important um and if they say that some part of the document is exempt that doesn't mean that all of it is exempt um asking for segregable information is key Basically, that will allow them to redact certain parts of it or remove certain parts and give you the rest so that you will have at least something or you can get your hand on it and maybe request in a different way or other documents. Um, you often know the law better than they do because as reporters and people who are requesting documents, we do that research, right? And we know what is available and what isn't. So we can explain that to them. Um, and, you know, again, Records custodians and people filling these requests aren't perfect. They're human and they may get things wrong and in the nicest way possible because they're, we're kind of at their mercy a little bit. We want to make sure that we explain it to them gently if need be um, and push harder if we absolutely have to. Um, and sometimes there's just information that they may quote withhold, right? And that's a choice. So the records custodian might say, well, I think that we can not give you this document about um, the student health um, STI reports, right? But if you go to their supervisor um, or the next person above, they might be able to say, you know what, we can actually let that go. It, it's it's our choice. It's our prerogative. Um, and if you don't succeed, you know, there's ways to get creative around that. 
does another agency have the same records? Would they release them, right? Um, in the case of the student health information, maybe the university doesn't want to release that information, but the state health department or the city county health department has that information for that area, and you can get that from uh, those records that way. Um, you can request your own files if they cite a privacy act or excuse me, a privacy exemption for an individual. You can go to your source or the person and say, hey, would you mind requesting this on your own behalf and then giving it to us? Um, FERPA is really annoying and so is HIPAA, but students can get their own. Uh, so FERPA is protects student records and documents. Um, students can get their request their own information and give it to you if that uh, is needed. Same thing with HIPAA. People can request their own medical information and give it to you. Um, and that's a way of getting around denials, right? Um, and then there's FOIA logs, which basically allow you to see what's been requested. And um, the FOIA log explorer here at Muckrock just launched. It's a great way to start. Um, and other agencies have different opportunities. There's things called FOIA reading rooms where you can go in and see what's been released um, and help uh, build up your um, understanding of what you can and can request. Um, so, you know, if you have any other questions, um, you can go to muckrock, info at muckrock.com or just join our muckrock.com slash Slack. And that will allow you to reach out to us and we'll be able to help um, with any of your questions or, you know, understanding. If you were a student, um, we have those free accounts um, for muckrock and you can start, you know, going through and requesting. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and I'm going to see if we have any questions in here. So, um, Michael, how would you like to? Yeah, you wanna... I'll just try to I'll try to pick some some questions, not in any particular order, but I, we had some great questions that I'd, I'd love to run by. you. So um, the first question was, how many states exempt state legislatures from open records requests? Uh, George mentions that Georgians cannot learn anything that happens under the gold dome. And I think that that can imagine be very frustrating. Yeah, um, it, it's interesting. I know that there's a lot of different exemptions from different states. I know South Dakota, for example, has an exemption that any communications between public agency between state agencies is not considered a public record. So internal emails from, let's say, the police department don't necessarily come out public. So um, I think it all depends on really the state and looking. And of course, we have our state pages that help. Um, fill that to better understand what your state wants. I'll drop in a resource. We do, I think it's like 25 states, or no, sorry, 45, about 45 states do, the public records laws do apply to the uh, legislative branch, but um, in practice, it's not as useful as it sounds because a lot of times they exempt all the interesting stuff anyway, um, we found. Um, Okay. So somebody, uh, Reagan, you asked if you can request information about requests, like emails about communications um, for the request you submitted. Yeah, um, that's actually a really interesting and fun to, uh, way to get in more information, um, especially if you get a denial or um, they're kind of short with you or say the records don't exist. You can file another request for information regarding the request you submitted, or even requests that have been submitted by other people. Um, and it's good to see what those internal communications are. You might find interesting stories um, in that. So, you know, if the college denies your request for certain documents and you submit a request for information relating, documents relating to that request, you might find that they're just saying, oh, it's standard denial. Here's the boilerplate information. Um, and it's, it's a really fun, way to get information but it can backfire might put you in their bad graces but it's definitely doable and possible uh jennifer asked and this is i like this question a lot how is foia different from open government mm, interesting um well foia is the law right and the open government is the policy right michael i'm gonna We'll let you explain a little more on that one. <laughs> I mean, I think open government is a more umbrella term, and I think FOIA is an important 
part of that, but open government also includes things like open meeting laws, which are often parallel to, to FOIA laws. Um, and I think open government is kind of that broader policy goal of you want a democracy to be subject to the people um, and public records is one of the ways that we get open government. Um, that's great. Oh, this is this is a tricky question. Um, Lori asked, my target organization is described as an independent nonprofit that accepts federal, state, and municipal dollars. The city collects quite a few documents from our target at least four times a year. Does the organization fall within the FOIA? Hmm. Well, from the city's perspective, yes. Um, if it's a private nonprofit, not all of not their documents aren't necessarily um, available unless it's going to the state and the state would have to report something. So you can pull some information um, if it's contracts, if it's um, email communications that can be done request that you that can be requested from your local or state agency. If it's tax filings, um, they have to report what's called a 990 form which is a nonprofit tax form where they release a lot of their information. Some of that is voluntary, so it's not included, but most of it you can't really get. It's it's essentially a, a private and nonprofit agency. So that's tough. I, I would recommend if you're trying to get that, go through the city and see what's, what's coming into the city and what's going out to that agency. Um, and then some, some nonprofits are actually really good about that. When you ask for information, they'll give it to you. Um, if they're bidding on a contract, there should be no, uh, contract bids that are available. Um, so there's a lot that's available, but it's it's not really something that you can FOIA or um, request as a public record from the, the organization. The agencies, the state, yes. Uh, Maggie asks, what if you're not sure your document exists, but you want to cast a wider net? Hmm. Well, I think using Google might be the best trick, right? So if you're, let's say that your document is a list of all of the, um, the students who, I don't know, were were suspended or something from your university or high school. I um, mean, you don't know if that list actually exists. Um, sometimes internal memos can be searched or sometimes internal documents can be searched on Google. So you might use the keyword um, suspended students at X school, you know, and then the site, you know, university.edu and then file type PDF, right? To see what's available and what's scraped. Um, you could also just go directly to the university or to the agency and ask and say, hey, um, I'm wondering, do you guys keep a list of students who were suspended? Uh, and, you know, what does that look like? Um, and then, you know, submitting a request for a list of all students suspended, um, if that exists, that might be a little wider or, you know, um, depending on whatever document you're looking for, being a little more vague on it would help. Um, and as a reminder, agent FOIA and records laws do not require agencies to make things for you. Um, it's only required to give you stuff that does not exist. So it that already exists. So if that list doesn't exist, the agency isn't required to create one for you. Um, we had a few questions related to FOIA logs. And I think this is this is kind of a good tee into it. But Steve asked, isn't it true whatever personal information you give on requests is available to the public as well? Essentially, I believe so. Some Most agencies redact personal and private information, phone numbers, addresses, social security numbers. That's generally redacted because it's a privacy issue. But your name, where you are requesting from, is generally public. Um, and... You know, if you're saying, you know, I'm requesting from this publication at this location, you know, if it's not going to reveal personal private information, generally that stuff is public. Right. Uh, Steve T just asked about uh, Muckrock's privacy policy and, and sort of how we handle that. I'm just going to drop in our privacy policy. Um, we try to collect as little information about our users as possible. Um, but we do, you know, when you file a request from Muck, through Muckrock, you can make it public or you can keep it private um, depending on sort of your needs for that request. We do encourage people to make the request public eventually so others can learn from them. So it's kind of public by default, but, um, you know, it, we do keep your email address private uh, and so on, but um, there's more details on that in our, our privacy policy. 
après. Um, all right, I think that covers most of those questions. Great questions and a lot of good discussions about FOIA logs. And uh, George, I'm very curious about the FOIA logs that you, you pulled out. Uh, if, if you'd be interested in sharing them at some point, I'd, I'd love to take a look. Um, and again, for any student participants, oh, we have another question from Lori. Do you want to drop your question into the chat? Oh, Antonio asks, can you do a request from abroad? Yeah, um, you can, the requests are open, right? So you can request state agencies and federal agencies that law applies here in the united states and um, certain territories so you can submit the requests from wherever you're at um, also just to note other countries have uh foia law essentially foia laws as well um they're a little more digitized because they came after what well some of them came after what we've done uh, what the united states has done so um, they're a little easier to navigate but um you can request for uh, federal, state, local agencies from wherever you're at. Though some states do have, I believe it's five, have a residency requirement. So you have to be a resident of that state to submit a request. Um, Muckrock has proxies that allow us to kind of assist that, but um, just being aware of what those limitations at the state level is. Um, but otherwise, yes, you can request from abroad. Um, how should you proceed when you know an agency is not providing you with responsive information? Oh, that's a tough one. Well, if you know that they're not providing you with responsive information, the first thing would be to, um, I think, ask what, why they're not providing you information. Like if there's an exemption they're citing to ask about that, um, go back and maybe ask about requests that are along those lines. If let's say you're requesting a document that you know exists, have, have you know, has been mentioned in multiple emails or documents and they're just not giving it to you, you know, understanding why is important, but what other related documents to that? Um, uh, that question that we had earlier, you know, requesting information re like, communications related to your request might be helpful. Um, and then, you know, using resources like the Student Press Law Center to help you kind of pull, push their hand, you know, making appeals. Um, at worst, you might have to, to take it to litigation and file a lawsuit. But, you know, understanding why they're denying the request, what their own retention schedules are, what their own regulations or rules are, for delivering requests, um, talking to a supervisor might help. So there's a few other options, but really at the end of the day, if they're just stonewalling you and making your life miserable and difficult, a lawsuit might have to be what you what you go to. Great. Um, well, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Albert, for the presentation. Thank you, everybody the, uh, who attended. I will drop the link. If you are a student uh, working with a student newsroom or um, just a student who's doing public records work, um, you can register here and we'll set you up with a free account and help you get up, uh, set up on Document Cloud if that'd be useful for uh, for your work. Um, just fill that out. Um, and I'll also mention, oh, sorry, I just responded wrong. You can just put in your information here. Um, and then if you wanna talk uh, public records and transparency, uh, we have a FOIA Slack where people share the requests, share interesting stories and so on. You can sign up there um, and hang out with other FOIA nerds. So uh, thank you again, Albert and everybody for attending and we're looking forward to some great, great requesting. Thanks everyone.